and welcome to the Louis Joel Gallery in Altona, Victoria. Um, my name is Karen Ingram and I am the manager of the Louis Joel Arts and Community and the Louis Joel Gallery. It is my privilege to, um, to manage this beautiful space and to invite artists and audiences in to appreciate art and to showcase their creative output. Today I am joined by Varga Hosseini and his father Fari Hosseini in this beautiful exhibition that we're looking at today. It's called Light Touch um, by Fari and Varga Hosseini. Welcome Varga. Thank you so much. Uh, my father and I are immensely pleased to be able to showcase our work in this gorgeous gallery. It's our second project with the Louis Joel Gallery. Uh, we set up an installation in the foyer in 2016, also exploring the theme of light and touch. But this is a, I suppose this is a much more extensive body of work uh, that explores the relationship between seeing and touching the visible and the tactile. The, the images that are here, like there is so many um like colours that draw you in, but it definitely is. You know, I like the, how you've named it, light touch. And I know there have been people that do really want to touch the <laughs> artwork. <laughs> so you put a temptation out there for everybody who comes in to view your artwork. Um, and uh, Vaga, you're also a writer. That's correct, yes. Um, so what, you know, how do you, how have you merged the art and your writing? I started off my artistic training in painting, majoring in painting, but near the end of my degree I became more interested in actually writing about art. So uh, it was really as a result of um, Dad's involvement with community art, making installations and displays for uh, the Altona Meadows Community Centre and North Altona Library that I became, uh, I caught the art bug if you like, mm -hmm. and got into the, uh, interested in helping Dad actually collaborate making work again. Okay. So uh, my career has been a mixture of making work and writing about it. Yeah. Ah, that's really great and um, I, I do love multidisciplinary artists that can bring about their, their passions and, um, and combine them in a way that is meaningful for them but also helps people understand the, the meaning and the, um, the process behind the work. So the fact that you did mention, um, you know, what you just said about your, you and your dad and what you've collaborated on, where does Fari's work end and yours begin? Or what, can you tell me a bit about how that all works? Is it cyclical? Mm -hmm. um, is it like a Venn diagram? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me That's a bit a about question. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, usually, uh, the painting process for us starts with a conversation about colour and uh, as you mentioned one of the most striking elements of the paintings is a use of colour. So we, we have a conversation about what kind of colours we like to use in a painting and then I usually come up with the composition, I translate that uh, from a sketchbook to the canvas and that's where my role kind of ends and the yeah. physical process of painting begins with Fari and then when Fari is done I apply the gesture, tactile gesture, and then again where that dries, Fari intervenes and paints it and adds the finishing touches in terms of the varnish. So it's a really uh, mutually supportive and symbiotic process, yes, knowing yes. when to contribute and when yes. to kind of pull back. Is there any tension at that time or when you want to step back or, or step in or you, you both obviously your father and son so you know each other fairly well um, and you use it sort of more non-verbal um, approach in that way? Over the course of time, it's almost a decade now since we've been collaborating, we've kind of learned we understand each other's contribution mm. so uh, it's really become more of a non-verbal process mm. now after so many paintings yeah. we've gotten to a groove of work yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i think that's so a, you know. when you become comfortable when you uh, set up a, i suppose a process mm -hmm. each person kind of knows their role and we kind of click like that yeah, it's okay. taken some time to develop to get to yeah, that point yeah yeah, yeah. 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 i was also um, just talking with others at the launch of your exhibition um a couple of weeks ago about the the process as I understood it then and just being in its presence 
the last few weeks was, um, you know, that there's a lot of process involved, you know, from even the city, starting with the sitting down of the conversation, um, you write in your program about, you know, exploring colour or choosing colour and even that takes you on a bit of a, you know, journey in itself and you haven't even put anything on the canvas yet. Yes. And so, you know, it's like a, it's a very slow process and would you say it's mindful? Absolutely. I think there is a, a very strong contemplative element of the work and I talk about that in both in terms of uh, the formal qualities but as you mentioned, it does take a lot of time for things to gel. Um, it is slow art because colour uh, really takes time to come to the fore literally. Uh, sometimes you may have an idea for a certain colour of blue but then you realise there are so many different shades of blue and mm. some blues work better with others. Yeah. So it is, a, it, it is mindful in the sense that there's a lot of visual thinking involved yeah. in terms of uh, using colour samples, uh, arranging and rearranging them, cutting and pasting them mm -hmm. to see which combination works. Yeah. And it's almost uh, good to go through that journey because yeah. it takes time uh, for you to be able to see, okay, this is how one sketch works, this is how another works, yes. and somewhere down the line you, you'll be able to see, okay, well, we have a more effective uh, combination of colours here. And you need to go through that process to get to that point, I think. Yeah, and so what comes first, the the colour or or the um, the mark? The colour, The colour, yeah, yeah, the colour comes first. It's like when... You know, I've spoken to musicians. Is it, you know, the lyrics or yes, the music? That's right, yes. <laughs> that comes first. I think uh, sometimes Dad and I are driving or we're doing something else and Dad mm. mentions, you know, well, that, 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 that rose is a beautiful colour. Mm. I think, okay, well, that's interesting mm. you pointed that out. Mm. So it can be something as trivial as that yeah. or mundane as that. Sometimes yeah. the influence can come from outside the realm of art, yes. but it can trigger a kind of thinking process. Yes. And then that's when we kind of uh, do the research, yep. finding the right colour sample and the right composition. Yeah. I know you have a slideshow to share with us shortly, but yes. I was also interested to, because there is a lot of thinking that goes behind it, at what point or does your, your collaboration and the work that you both do, at what point does it land in your heart or mm. when does it, it embodies you? I think... Um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about yeah. that. I suppose if there's an embodiment, it really would happen uh, when the paintings are finished and someone else mm. comes to give us feedback about yeah. it. Yeah. I think that's when you feel, okay, it's interesting that people are responding to the work in this way. It's when the work is done and it's no longer yours in a sense, you're putting it in a public space mm. and it's now got a life of its own. Mm -hmm. The feedback that you get uh, can be really... Um, reassuring mm. and people see things in your work that you were kind of dealing with but you couldn't verbalize at the oh, time yeah. so it, it takes the eyes and the voices of other people mm. to bring that sense of okay well, so this is what people are, are responding to and this is what people can see and during the opening i, I was really surprised by just how accurate people's mm. responses were to the colors and the textures mm. so I felt like, okay, well, so it does resonate, it does strike a chord. Yes. And that's when the work feels like, okay, we're actually perhaps on the right track yeah, or yeah. We, we are able to hit a certain mark. Well, that, well and also it's, it's something that I would love more people who are not artists but who can appreciate art and gain something from viewing art mm. and... and responding and reflecting upon artwork and and that dialogue with the artist if they're lucky. Yeah, I think uh, I like the fact that uh, when you do release the work into the into a public space, um, usually people who may not have an artistic training can sometimes bring the most uh, perceptive mm. insights mm -hmm. into their into their experience mm. of the work. So for anyone from children to yeah. even the elderly who mm -hmm. may not come from an artistic background yeah. and yet they bring their own life experiences to, exactly. the, to the painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. it's good. Well, they're seeing part of themselves if they're able to, to, to respond in that way. Something has resonated with them even uh, more deeply and if it matches what you intended, all very well, but right. it doesn't have to. No, it doesn't have to. In fact, it's uh, the fact that... Uh, 
you do get interpretations that can be uh, sometimes out of the blue. Mm. They, they illuminate an element of the work that you yourself may not have ever seen. Yes. That's when you think, wow, I didn't think that uh, people could read in those uh -huh. terms. So uh -huh. probably one of the funniest and most memorable um, responses to the work was from our previous exhibition. And the comment is by a five-year-old child in our guest book, just three words, they look yummy. And it was, <laughs> I thought, well, that is pretty much on the point that because is. there is a, a lustrous, um, mm -hmm. as you've mentioned, the, the temptation to touch. Yeah. It's almost like a lolly yeah. or a yeah. confection, yeah. Maria. Then you can't touch. No. And you, you know, not good if you do touch. <laughs> That's great. Um, are you ready now to sure. show, talk to your slides that yes. you've prepared, which um, is another yeah, fantastic element that you bring um, apart from, you know, the, you know, more like an academic um, article that you've written about your artwork and the, the collaboration of you and your father. Um, I do notice you keep, you know, uh, your relationship is probably not well, as well you know, documented, mm -hmm. but in a way, this is the documentation. Absolutely, of your, I think the work is a testament side. to that to that process, mm. and I think um, I do talk about a little bit about it. The fact that there is a, throughout the work there is a dialogue, and it, there is a reigning in of self interest. We have this idea of the artist usually as a as an individual loner working in a gallery. The artist is genius kind mm -hmm. of stereotype. Mm -hmm. I've never really been happy with that mm -hmm. because I think. There are traditions of art that are actually collective, collective and communal in character, yes. where more than one artist actually in, uh, is involved in the process. And I do mention that, um, especially with colour, that conversation that we have about colour also translates to other aspects of the, the painting. So we are constantly kind of conversing, uh, maybe not verbally, but certainly in, in terms of the formal qualities that eventuate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, well, it's fascinating. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing so far. And let's go on to your slideshow now. Sure. Uh, today I'm hoping to explore the exhibition in more detail. And one of the ways that I think I'll be doing that is elaborating on the themes and aesthetic of the, uh, the paintings. So thematically, uh, Light Touch is first and foremost a collaborative and intergenerational project, uh, one where my father and I have joined forces and brought our different levels of expertise and sets of skills to the painting process. And the exhibition uh, essentially explores the relationship between seeing and touching the visible and the tactile. And we have uh, showcased the selection of mixed media paintings produced from 2020 right up to the present. And in a nutshell, the paintings attempt to trace the effect of light on uh, coloured, patterned, textured and reflective surfaces. In terms of their aesthetic, uh, stylistically the paintings draw upon uh, numerous sources, so uh, 20th century American and European painting, the memory of times and places of personal significance, uh, also complementary disciplines like literature, cinema, philosophy and even television. And, uh, this is an aesthetic that really has uh, emerged gradually, incrementally, and through multiple reference points. And it's in fact these different outlets that have shaped the different formal elements of the paintings. And we can now look at those elements in more detail. So uh, one of the most striking elements of the paintings is colour. And uh, I suppose uh, our point of uh, influence, one of the most influential figures for us has been Robert Motherwell. Uh, Robert Motherwell is a key figure in post-war 20th century American art, both as a writer and a painter, and is often associated with the New York School that includes other artists like Barnett Newman, Jackson Pollock, Clifford Still, uh, and Ryan Hart, among others. And I think um, it's almost 30 years now since I encountered this particular painting by Robert Motherwell while I was uh, completing the final year of my secondary education. It was while I was browsing through the textbook for Year 12 Art that I came across Summer Open with Mediterranean Blue, and it really marked a watershed in my artistic training. But Motherwell was doing something else here. He offered a different pathway. It was possible using the leanest and most minimal of means, in this case, uh, brushstroke, 
colour and line to actually evoke a sense of time, summer, a sense of place, the Mediterranean, and uh, even a sense of architecture, uh, a sense of uh, an opening, a window, or, or, or a portal, uh, or a door even. So it was uh, the metaphoric possibilities of painting using a, a non-figurative, or what is more commonly called an abstract visual language that really struck a chord with me. And intimations of Motherwell's use of colour and form can be seen throughout the paintings in our exhibition. Uh, especially it's the, uh, the shades and shifts of colour here. So he's taken blue, but we have lots of different uh, uh, variations of blue in the single painting from cobalt and ultramarine to the more creamy blues, even verging on reddish blues, lilac and purple. And also the almost uh, skeletal ghostly insinuation of form in the painting using just a charcoal to inscribe a line on, on the surface. Uh, it really is a different way of uh, depicting landscape, and it, it struck a chord with me uh, for almost 30 years now. So it's uh, interesting how a painting can lodge itself in your memory. And uh, colour is certainly one of the ways that we process, interpret and represent light. Uh, and a minimal and monochrome colour scheme appears in many of our paintings. So this is usually a variation of a single colour that's presented in tritone in terms of light, medium and dark. And uh, colour selection um, really involves experimenting with, with sample cards. And sample cards are those wonderful portable palm size cards with colour swatches that you find in any Bunnings warehouse or paint retailer. So we can often spend anywhere from weeks to months, even six months, uh, cutting and pasting, rearranging sample cards, really to come up with the right blend for a painting. And um, these paintings really convey light through the subtlety and nuance of chromatic relationships. So, for example, this is the, the these are the background colours of the of the, uh, the painting uh, Tableland, Wild Road Ahead, and we can see that we've used the, the light colour for the internal frame, we've used the medium colour for the central panel, and we've we've reserved the darkest colour for the outside border. And it's really the, um, the relationship between colours, how one colour recedes, another one advances, and then there's a middle colour that kind of mediates the tension between them. It's that push and pull effect that we're trying to, I suppose, evoke in paintings like this. Another very important uh, visual element, uh, formal element of our paintings is, of course, pattern. And by pattern, I mean the repetition of a mark or design throughout the composition. And here it's the American filmmaker Stanley Kubrick, whose work has been quite instructive, particularly his 1956 motion picture, The Killing. It was uh, while I was uh, around 1996 uh, in vocational art school where I came across a photographic still uh, of this motion picture in a film magazine. And it really struck me by the way that Kubrick has literally framed the light here in the sense that he's shown us what happens when light enters a room. It has a dual and paradoxical function. On the one hand, light illuminates and allows us to see things. But on the other hand, in interacting with the elements of a room, light also obscures what we can see, it casts shadows. And uh, it suggests that uh, there's a patterning of light and darkness, an interplay with light and dark that makes up our experience of light. So the experience of the visible is in an important sense framed and patterned. Shadows, darkness and non-visibility, even in a certain sense blindness, they're not the opposite of light but they condition our perception of it. And these paintings use motifs that really evoke this filtered experience of light. So for example, the pattern of windows with their frames, their slats, their Venetian blinds are a recurring feature throughout these paintings. The application of colour and pattern to the paintings also uh, transforms the surface and creates surface differences. And here it's the Italian Argentinian painter and sculptor Lucio Fontana uh, that has been quite important. Uh, Fontana is one of those artists who has really foregrounded the important role that surface plays in our experience of painting. Uh, legend has it that he was working on a painting one day and it really wasn't going the way he wanted it to. And he became so frustrated that he actually took a, a blade and, and, and slashed the canvas. One of the cardinal rules of painting, mm. don't 
damage the surface, he's actually done that. And rather than throwing the painting out, we realise that in doing that, he's actually uh, expanded our understanding of the spatial possibilities of painting, because space isn't something that we simply represent on the canvas, say, in terms of perspective, but uh, by actually uh, physically manipulating the surface, he's showing us something that we normally don't see through to the underside of the canvas and even the wall behind it. So it's the, uh, the array of different uh, punctures and lacerations here that really uh, expands what we mean by space here in visual terms. And surface variations certainly characterise all of our paintings, but they have developed not so much through phys physically injuring or damaging the canvas, but rather in two ways, through the gradual application of paint, through, through masking and layering, and through the varying levels of distribution uh, across the surface. Uh, there are, in fact, three types of surfaces in our paintings. There's the outside border, the internal frame, and the central field. And uh, each if really differs in terms of their depth and tactility. You have a really flat surface, a more stippled surface, and a coarser granulated surface. And what's interesting that, is that light actually plays off these uh, surface differences by picking out the contrasting planes of paint. And we can see here the flattest color is the first one that's often applied uh, in the internal frame. And then the second layer is usually the outside border, which creates a more stippled effect. And the most heavily layered uh, element of the painting is a central field that gives us a more coarse granulated texture. And yes, uh, surface differences segue into texture. Uh, as you mentioned, one of the most striking elements of the works is actually the tactile mark. And the inspiration here is the British painter Jason Martin, whose work I encountered not in an art magazine or in a gallery, but actually uh, on television during a, a, a screening of Matthew Collins's documentary, This Is Modern Art, the Nothing Matters episode. And in a wonderful, uh, brisk montage, Matthew Collins actually films Jason Martin at work, uh, creating a painting from start to finish. We actually see him open up tubs and jars of paint, take heavy impasto with a palette knife, uh, literally cake it onto the canvas, and then he proceeds to use a six-foot comb to then drag across the surface of the paint, back and forth, to and fro, until he creates a rather undulating and striated texture. And after watching this, I thought, well, this is, this is amazing. I, I was experimenting with texture in my own work, but the, uh, the use of a comb to create this kind of pattern really struck a chord with me. And Martin's work has been a, a reference point for the tactile marks that we see in our paintings. And a tactile gesture is re uh, really a, a motif and centerpiece of all of our canvases. And making such a gesture means working with the surface of a medium with implements. So the medium in question is 3D texture modeling paste, which we purchase in large four liter buckets so we don't run out. <laughs> And the implement is, uh, it can be spatulas, paint scrapers, or more commonly plastic combs in different shapes, sizes. And it's the actual, uh, it's the pockets of nothingness uh, between the teeth of the comb that actually are responsible for creating the wonderful patterns that we see, uh, the lovely grooves and lines in many of the tactile gestures. And this is the process really in photographic terms or temporal terms. Once the background pattern and colour has been uh, applied to the canvas, we then scoop out the texture paste uh, until we get to a point of density and thickness in the second and final frame. And then I drag the comb across the surface to create the pattern effects. And then it really is a case of leaving it alone, walking away. And my father is really good at reminding me to don't touch it, let it dry, don't go near it, because there is that temptation to always try to see if the paste is dry so you know when to, when to paint. But it's uh, really a case of knowing it's at this point where you allow the mark to actually dry and do its own thing. And a tactile gesture really brings into play the meaning of light touch in multiple senses, so as contact, mediation, reaction, time, and transformation. 
In the catalogue essay, I go into detail about each of these senses, but I can give a shorthand. So light touches contact really means to not overthink it or overwork it. Simply drag the comb across the surface of the paste in a fluid, uh, swift, uh, fluent flourish. Uh, as mediation, uh, what you're really doing in the process is that um, it's not just you that's making the mark. It's the paint scraper, it's the comb that's doing, it's mediating the mark for you. There's a non-human mechanical element to the gesture. Uh, reaction, texture case also plays its own part in the process. It will react and it will actually create cavities, pores, pockets and marks that you actually uh, didn't even anticipate. Uh, time makes light touch of your agency because uh, the texture paste and painting more generally unfolds in time. It's a temporal process. And uh, in, in basically drying, uh, texture paste will transform. It will not be identical at the time of making the mark. What you end up with is something totally different texture paste in drying, it will lose its veneer and its density. So in all of this, I think, uh, in a word, something happens other than what you wanted or expected. And rather than seeing that, I suppose, as a disappointment or a failure or getting frustrated, it's really about understanding that um, if there is invention in painting, it doesn't have to do with you. Uh, it really has to do with the materials and mediums that you use. It's usually the other, and by the other I mean uh, not just uh, the materials or the mediums, but in this case it's also your collaborator that has a say in the process. And uh, in a word, unforeseen marks will eventuate, and again it's they that attract, the limb, attract and limb the light, not just what you want to do. And that brings us to probably the most uh, uh, illuminating aspect of the work, reflection. Uh, the paintings do have a shimmering, glossy, lustrous quality to them. And here, uh, the reference point for me is the Australian painter, Dale Frank, uh, whose work I encountered at the Art Gallery of South Australia near the end of my bachelor's degree. And this painting really struck a chord with me, uh, both in terms of its uh, visual elements and also its lovely lyrical title. Uh, Dale Frank has made an entire body of work where he actually uses something that is reserved for the final touch of a painting, varnish, as the paint itself. He pours it onto the canvas and then he physically tilts the canvas to distribute the varnish in different ways and we can see in some areas the varnish is quite translucent, allowing us to see the background colour and in other areas it's actually a really uh, gathered and accumulated and at some point even thanks to the law of gravity it started drooping down the canvas and uh, it creates a lovely lambent glowing kind of effect and it reflects the light in that sense but as the title also suggests it, it, it triggers a lot of different associations that we, we, we make uh, custard cream old ivory irish linen beeswax so a whole uh, a set of chain of associations in our mind can be triggered by looking at something that is uh, reflective in a visual sense so there are two important senses of the word reflection reflection uh, is often the outward projection of light from the surface of something but it's also a profound inward contemplation of a given subject what we often refer to as a meditation or cogitation and both of these meanings come into play when light actually leaves its trace on our surroundings. And our paintings harbour the desire to really convey or visualise this dual reflectivity. And they do so in two ways. Uh, formally, through the use of reflective paints and mediums, but also theoretically by drawing upon other disciplines like literature and global events. So in formal terms, we use metallic uh, paints and lustrous varnishes to accentuate the visual reflectivity of light. So metallic acrylic uh, in the uh, Holcroft variety is a, is a good source of uh, giving a really nice glossy uh, veneer to the tactile gesture. And then we use gloss and satin varnish as well as a finish.
And we can see here we've used the metallic acrylic to coat the tactile gesture of the painting table and the wild road ahead. And then we've applied a gloss varnish to it to really bring out the, uh, the play of light. And we've used the satin varnish for the outside border to create that lovely shifting light across the surface of the canvas. But the uh, desire to actually uh, make the paintings reflective in the other sense, as uh, hopefully allowing people to contemplate what they're looking at, that can come from another area, and literature has been really influential here, uh, including the work of uh, Don DeLeo, White Noise. Uh, in his novel White Noise, Don DeLeo describes light as both a luster on a painted surface but also a phenomena that elicits all uncertainty and quiet contemplation in a viewer. And his example is sunsets. Sunsets are those luminous events that really manifest both these senses of reflection as both resplendence and rumination. And the paintings in this exhibition likewise attempt to reflect the light and to provoke reflection. And uh, this painting in particular, Ken Trail's Sunset, The Splendor of Disease, White Noise, uh, as we can see, we've really attempted to channel De Leo here, using sunsets as a point of reference. We've used uh, intense reds and oranges as a background colour and a pale gold to capture that um, the effect of the setting sun. But as the title also suggests, um, the painting was produced at the, the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, where there was a lot of agitation, uncertainty, sometimes even bordering on paranoia and what was happening around us, the 5G network, chemtrails, and all of those things that was happening globally kind of fed into this work. And I suppose it is our hope in paintings like this to make works that are visually beautiful and reflective, but also they allow the viewer to really kind of think about the, the effect that light has on them and uh, give them something to really to think about. And if uh, for further paintings and insights on visual culture, uh, feel free to visit our website, Projector, and the link is there. And I uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk in more detail about the exhibition and the different elements that go into it. Varga, that was incredible. That was <laughs> just, again, um, so much depth and thought behind everything that you and your father, Fari Hussein, um, Hasseini, um, that you both create together, if that is not a testament to intergenerational, um, uh, what's the word, yeah, sim, 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 symbiotic, symbiotic. Yeah. like it's really, yeah, I think we all have a lot to, even that very notion is enough to reflect upon. Yes, yeah. yeah so <laughs> I, um, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to spend with us today in presenting the all of the the background and um there's a beautiful program which i'm hoping you will also make available digitally or it's on your website that people can can um, look further into you know the words behind your art and i thank you very much and thank you for choosing to exhibit at louis joel gallery here in altona thank it's you. been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs>